Okay, so the goal for today's uh, lecture is to talk about resilient estimation And let me state what the problem setting is. So I have a bunch of, I have a state plus wt. I have observation yt equals to c xt plus vt. And the row of A is less than one. So the spectral radius of A is strictly less than one. It's not a control system, it's just a stochastic process. XT is a stochastic process, there is no UT here. But even if you add UT, the intuition that we are going to discuss today is not really going to change significantly. Uh, all of this stuff is from the book that's already on your Carmen uh, page. So if you need further information, please go back to that book. Okay. So this is the state update equation. I'm uh, going to assume that yt is in Rm. And of course, xt is in Rn. Okay, now there are some assumptions that I'm going to make. All of you know what infinity norm is? Infinity norm, the maximum, no? Okay, I'm going to use infinity norm in this class. So for a vector, no, x is already used, uh, y, z. No, z will be used later. Let me say H, Rn, this is infinity norm of the vector H, the maximum absolute value of the elements in H. Sorry? What's the meaning of this infinity norm thing? So you remember 2-norm, right? The, the usual H i square. That's right. Yeah. This can also be used to measure distance between two points in the Euclidean space. But in an infinite space? Like no. So, so remember, uh, what is the L2-norm? This is summation i equals 1 to n h i square square root, right? So just like you can define L2 norm, you can define LP norm for p between infinity. Okay, this is also a norm. L2 norm is just a special case of LP norm. And now I'm taking L infinity norm, which is letting P go to infinity. Then what happens? So if you look at this expression, you can view it as about
Oh, there should be a peat no peat thing here. So you can you can take the max outside and then you can put the max inside. And you can let P go to infinity. So let me. Right, so I took the thing outside and then I put the rest of the thing inside. And then I'm going to let limit P go to infinity. Well, I'm not going to define it this way. I'm just uh, giving you the intuition. So I'm going to let P go to infinity. And so I take this part out. And then I have this, this term doesn't depend on P. So I can take this out further. So I write limit. P goes to infinity. No, I'm just I'm just taking the max H I so I'm look at this expression. Okay? I'm going to divide it by max H I raised to P and then I'm going to take that term outside. Because that term doesn't depend on P, so I can take it outside of the limit. Okay, now this term is strictly less than one for most of the terms, except for the term that is actually the maximum, right? So, so now this, what happens when you take something, like a term that is less than one, and then raise it to p, where p is going to infinity? Term less than one and yeah. raise it to p, is, it makes it smaller. Like How much smaller? I'm letting p go to infinity it becomes zero, right? So all the terms will get killed and only one term will remain which is corresponding to the max term, right? So it's just the intuition. This is not the formal definition. This is the formal definition, but this is where the definition gets derived from. <coughs> so naturally, you know, if you have two terms that are maximum, then this will be square root of two, right? But, but we don't want to consider all those edge cases. So we just define it this way and it turns out to be a norm. It satisfies all the conditions for being a norm. <coughs> Does this make sense to everyone? Okay. So that's that is known as the infinity norm for a vector. So I'm going to make the following assumption that the noise, infinity norm of the noise is less than epsilon. So the noises are small, it's not that big. Let me write it, small noise. Okay, so if you have a sensor, how do you make the noise small? How do you make the noise of a sensor small? Well, you can't really make the noise of a specific sensor small, but you can always buy sensors that are more expensive and therefore will have much smaller noise. So I actually was looking for a temperature sensor for my Raspberry Pi and I had like a cheap $5 sensor with plus minus one degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that was the error. So this epsilon was one for that sensor. And then I bought a $20 sensor, temperature sensor, and there the accuracy was plus minus 0 0.0625 degrees Celsius. So I just paid 15 extra dollars to get a better sensor where epsilon was 0 0.0625, okay? Okay, now the second assumption is that adversary can corrupt at most Q 
which is less than m over 2 sensors in yt. So yt consists of m sensors, yt is giving you m readings. So adversary can corrupt the information from at most q, which is strictly less than m over 2 sensors. So this building has uh, 50 temperature sensors, one in each room, and the adversary can corrupt less than 25 sensors in the building. And then the third assumption is uh, I need to define a notation. So notation, I am going to define CJ, no, I have to start with J. So J is a subset of 1 to M. These are the set of all sensors. And so I'm picking a subset of those sensors. And then I have CJ, which is uh, CJ1. CJK. So J is given by these are the rows of C corresponding to sensors. In J. And similarly, I'm going to define Y J T as Y. J1, YTJK. So I'm picking J sensors, sorry, sensors in this set J, capital J. The sensors are indexed as J1 to JK. And I define CJ, which is, I'm just picking those rows that corresponds to those sensors. And YTJ, which is those sensor readings corresponding to sensors in the set J. And so the For every j such that the number of elements in j is less than or equal to m minus 2q, there exist lj. such that rho of A plus Cj Lj is less than 1.
LJ is the observation gain. It's the observer gain. Sorry? Q is the number of sensors adversary can corrupt. This is Q. Q. Okay, I think somebody had this question. Did you have the question about this long time back? Okay. Right, so we have a, a bunch of assumptions here. The noises are small. So Gaussian noise is eliminated. You cannot have Gaussian noise because Gaussian noise can have infinite value. Um, of course, the probability is very small. In fact, the reason why we make Gaussian noise assumption is not because we expect the noise to have infinite values, but purely because a lot of the math becomes very easy if the noise is Gaussian. So you can get closed form expressions, apply it on actual system, and it just seems to work very well. Uh, but in this case, for the theory to work, we require the, the magnitude of noise to be bounded, the noise to be small. And you can always buy better actuators and better sensors so that your noise is pretty small. The second assumption here is that adversary cannot corrupt all the sensors. The adversary can corrupt only a few sensors. So what does it, what does, what does it mean to corrupt a few sensors? Well, it can corrupt a Q number of sensors which, where Q is strictly less than M over two. So that means that adversary is corrupting few, fewer sensors and you have a lot more redundancy in the system. Now, of course, if you expect the adversary to corrupt a lot of sensors, then in order to add redundancy, you have to put even more sensors into the system so that, the adversary, so that if the adversary corrupts something, you should be able to recover the state. Okay, so it's purely a matter of what do you expect the adversary to do and then put appropriate number of sensors in the system so as to counter the attack from the adversary. The other thing that is somewhat less intuitive but something that you should know is don't think of these sensors as only one kind of sensor. So don't think of it only as temperature sensors. You can perhaps have other kind of sensors that can provide you with the same information that you are looking for, but it has a completely different physics, for instance, or a completely different security, uh, uh, security issues. So for instance, I want to measure the temperature of this room, and of course the temperature sensor costs five dollars, so I can buy and put here in this room and it'll measure the temperature. But I could also buy infrared cameras, which are $100 infrared cameras that can also measure the temperature, or at least it can give you some information about the temperature. And so even though one type of adversary can corrupt the infrared sensor, but it cannot corrupt the temperature sensor, another kind of adversary can corrupt the temperature sensor, but may not be able to corrupt the infrared sensor. Same thing on vehicles. LiDAR is susceptible to attack, and camera is susceptible to attack. But you should put both LiDAR and camera because the two attacks are completely different from each other. So therefore, if an adversary corrupts one sensor, you still have another sensor to fall back on. So just think of sensors as, as in, in a most generic sense and, and always think about different types of sensors that you can mix and match so that it becomes more robust to, robust against attacks. So in, in vehicles, we have LiDAR, we have camera, and we have radar. We have three different types of sensors. And it's not just one radar. You have a radar on the right side, you have a radar on the left side. You may have a radar uh, array in the front of the vehicle or on the top of the vehicle. So you have just a lot of redundancy in vehicles. So, so as to make sure that you meet this requirement. 
And the third requirement is for every set of sensors such that the number of sensors is less than m minus 2q, there exists an observer gain Lj such that rho of A plus Cj Lj is less than, strictly less than 1. Okay, and this is required for stability of filtering. Uh, and and when, you, when, you, when we talked about Kalman filtering, the observer gain in Kalman filter always led to this particular uh, condition. So we didn't really talk about this condition there, but now we have to talk about it. We want this Lj to satisfy this condition. Okay, I guess I should put a negative sign here, not positive. Please make that correction. There should be a negative sign here. Okay. Now this is how we are going to do resilient estimation. So I have a system, a stochastic process and some observation of the stochastic process. The adversary has corrupted certain number of sensors. I don't know which sensors are corrupted. Okay, I, I have no idea. But I know that Q of those sensors have been corrupted. And of course the third condition is satisfied. Now the question is how do I estimate X hat T, which is a good estimate of X T, and reject all the corruptions that were done by the adversaries in Y T. How do you think you would solve this problem? So you have a vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, you have a bunch of sensors on autonomous vehicle, and you just don't know which of the sensor readings have been corrupted. The radar is saying one thing, the camera is saying something else, the LIDAR is saying something else, right? So how do you reconcile different information that's coming to the computer? The computer is totally confused. It doesn't know what to do because yeah. Previous values told like uh, right. the sensor was correct. We can get a lookup table and store all the values in the lookup table. Right. But then when something goes wrong, we right. can compare all of the values that different sensors are giving uh -huh. with that lookup table and then find out like which which one is correct and which one is following the previous values that uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. we used to get uh, when right. the sensor right. was correct. And that we can so you basically want to do the following. You want to look at the current sensor readings. You want to look at the historical information. And then you want to check the residual. Yeah. And you want to reject those sensors that are not meeting the residual requirements. Yeah. Okay, good. That's what we will do, okay? <laughs> but there is more to it. There is more to it. So, so imagine you are driving on a highway at 70 miles an hour. And the previous information that was one second ago, uh, you have already traveled, I don't know, like uh, 15 meters or 20 meters. And so the scenery has changed, the configuration of vehicles have changed. So how, how are you going to use the lookup table to do something on an ongoing basis? I was going to ask this question. How do you know your histories have... Right. The car might have come in that one second. The car which was on this lane in the previous time step has come in front of you. Now what do you do? Your, your work will... Your, your algorithm will work beautifully if you were in a situation where the entire environment was stationary and you were the only person moving. Like you're driving in like Death Valley National Park. Yes, <laughs> there's no one in Death Valley, it's, it's a Death Valley National Park, there's no one in Death Valley National Park and you are the only car going. And the scenery is not changing, the surrounding is not changing, you are just driving in the valley. Uh, but not on California Highway or not on Columbus Highways, right? Any other thoughts? Q, Q sensors have been corrupted, you don't know which Q sensors are corrupted. Yes, please. In the case of fusion body address, a cortex fusion body address of all the sensor states, then try to uh, uh, use the maximum overlapping of. Uh, you are, yeah, you are getting close to the solution. Okay. So, 
So what we will do is we will run multiple estimators in parallel. So we'll assume, we'll pick a bunch of sensors and we'll run a Kalman filter for that. Then we'll pick another bunch of sensors, we'll run Kalman filter for that and so on and so forth. So now we have like 15 Kalman filters or 20 Kalman filters running in parallel with different set of sensors, assume. And then there is an information fusion block where you are going to check if which of the estimates are close to each other, which of the estimates are true to the, uh, are, are close to each other, and based on that particular estimate, you will take some sort of median or mean to estimate what the current state of the system is. Okay, so let's, let's talk about how to do that. So I'm going to run x hat t plus 1 j, oh, uh, j should be in the bracket. So I pick a set of sensors j in j, and then I run a Kalman filter. This should be C J. Yeah. And here we are going to pick all J. J equals to M minus Q. You don't know, you know Q, but you don't know which sensors, which of the Q sensors. Oh. If you have 50 sensors, How do you know that? Uh, that is the attack model, right? So okay. you have to determine what the attack, if, if, if all sensors are corrupted, then there is nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. So you have to put some restriction on the attacker. So the attacker restriction is, the attacker can only corrupt Q sensors. So the attacker can only corrupt LiDAR, uh -huh. and you have two LiDARs, and you have three cameras and you have six radars, right? So two is okay. the number of sensors that can be corrupted. Or if I'm, if you're thinking about an attack on this building and I'm the only attacker, I can only put my hand on one temperature sensor at a time. I can't be in two or three rooms at a time, right? So, so those are the kind of attack scenarios you are considering. <clears throat> So you pick all different uh, sequence of sensors such that the number of sensors you are considering is M minus Q. How many such filters do you have to run? So what's the cardinal? How many types of set J are there such that the cardinality of J is M minus Q? Well, that's equal to M factorial over m minus q factorial q factorial. So this is m choose m minus q. So you have to run these many estimators in your computer, okay? Not an easy task, by the way, but you have to run so many estimators in the computer. This is the, this is the number of this is the cardinality of J, and these are the number of J such that the cardinality of J is equal to M minus Q. So this is the number of sets of sensors J such that cardinality of J equals to M minus Q. 
So out of m sensors, you have to pick m minus q sensors. So that is m choose m minus q. That's given by this expression. Just to give you an example, if m equals to 5, q equals to 2, then m choose m minus q will be equal to 10. So if you have five sensors and you expect the adversary to attack at most two sensors at a time, you have to run 10 parallel estimators in your computer. Okay? I'm going to erase this part because I need the board. Now I'm going to look at ZT of J, which is yt of j minus cj x hat sorry this should be t x hat t of j and this is your residue residual M is the number of uh, sensors you have. So YT is an RM. And Q is also the number of sensors, right? Q is the number of sensors that the adversary can attack. Can't attack? Adversary can corrupt at most Q sensors. OK. okay. So I, I'm running an estimator, I'm running multiple parallel estimators, I'm running 10 parallel estimators, let's say. I'm looking at the residual of every estimator. So I look at the observation from those sensors, and then I look at the estimate that I get from those sensors, and I look at the residual, ZT. And then I'm going to define something. We say, that x hat t j is valid. So an estimate is valid if z1 j infinity z2 j infinity zt j infinity is less than equal to some constant which depends on j. Now this constant is something that you will have to figure out from trial and error, like you will, you will run multiple tests under attack to try and figure out what should those constants j be. But those constants depend on a, c, uh, epsilon, q, and all of these other quantities, whatever values of lj you pick here and things like that. So depend this constant, even though theoretically you can find what this constant is, that theoretical value is pretty loose. And it depends on a lot of different parameters. So what I would say as practitioners, you just try to run the system and try to figure out what these constants look like. OK? And then you pick an appropriate constant, just like we did for the hypothesis testing problems so far in the class. So an estimate is valid if my residual at time 1, residual at time 2, residual at time t, all of them are below some constants that we have to figure out through trial and error. And let's say, 
I want to write cursive J. How is cursive J written? This looks good. I think this looks like J. No, this doesn't look like J. I want to write a very beautiful J. Okay, something like this. This is the set of all J such that x hat tj is valid. Okay, so I have picked the set of valid estimates. Now how should I estimate the state? How should I estimate the state? Well, my x hat t is going to be, okay, uh, there are multiple ways by which you can define x hat t. What should I, I'll erase this side. Can someone tell me how do you define x hat t, which is the estimate of the, the resilient estimate of the state? How do you define x hat t? Any thoughts? So I know all the valid. I have, I'm running 10, estimate, uh, 10 estimators, and I've figured that six of them are valid estimators, okay? So this j, this, this cursive j, is the set of all the set of sensors that is providing you with a valid estimate. Now, how do you want to define x hat t? So you have six estimates, all of them are valid. All of them are valid because the residual are all small, they are below constant that you have fine tuned through trial and error. So you keep those signals and then estimate the rest, right? I mean, the, if, if x hat is valid, this means that those signals are fine. Those, yeah, those estimates are fine so because the residuals are small. Yeah. So, so now you have six different estimates of the state. So you have one estimate x hat t of like j1. This is 1.1, 1 .1, 0, 1.2, 3, 0. And then you look at x hat t j2, that is 1.05, 0 0.05, 1.1, 0 1.2, 0 0.97, and then 0 0.03, and so on. You have like six such estimates that are all valid. But as you can see, you have to pick one, right? So you can't have like six estimates for controller design. So you have to pick, you have to, you have, so your computer is giving you such vectors that are all close to each other, but they are different, and you need to pick one. The least. Least? I mean, the least difference, right? Yeah. Because, the, like, for example, Z1 mm -hmm. is the... Uh, oh, I see. So you are taking the least of residual. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a, that's a reasonable way to define a estimate, so you will pick the estimate for which your zt of j infinity is strictly small, like the, the smallest zt of j. I think that's, that's fine, you can define it either way, but the way it was defined in a paper was as follows. You can come up with different ways, it's just that the paper considered a very specific estimator and then uh, prove that that estimate is a resilient estimate, which means that it's not going to give you very high residual with respect to what the true state is. And so that was min of i, no, min of j in 
कर्सिव जे एक्स हैट टी आई एक्स हैट टी आई जे प्लस मैक्स max of x hat t i j Okay, so this is coming from a paper written in 2015. I forgot the name of the author, Nakahira and Mo, I think. So, if you pick this value as your estimate, so you look at for every element i of the state or the estimate, you look at the minimum value among all the valid estimates. Look at the maximum value among all the valid estimates. Take the average of it. Okay. Now this is not the only way to define the estimator. What they proved was that this estimate has some nice properties. Okay. So what they proved was x hat t minus the true state x t will have some bounded error. No matter how many times the adversary, no matter how much adversary has corrupted the measurement, it will still have bounded error. That was their main result. Main result. Um, but you can come up with other estimators, just like you know, one of you said you will pick the one with minimum residual. That's a perfectly fine x hat t. It's just that you will have to then go ahead and prove that it will always give you a good estimate of x t because the error is going to be bounded in some sense. <coughs> Or alternatively, if I were in this position, if I had reached this stage, I would have just take, taken the median of every entry. Okay, so instead of taking the the average of the minimum value and the maximum value, I would have taken the median of all the entries, or I would have taken the geometric median of the vectors x hat t j. Geometric median is is a concept of median extended to vector valued. Uh, random variables. But we don't know. Like we'll be getting so median. So the values will be different every time, right? That's right. It will be different every time. So how will you but you will still have. You will still be making small error with respect to x t. So how are you going to take the median then? If the values are different every time. What, so even the estimates are different every time. You're driving your vehicle. Your estimate is going to be different every time. How is that a problem? That's not a problem at all, because all of these values are going to be different. Y t is going to be different. X hat t is going to be different. Your residuals are going to be different every time. So that's not really the key problem here, unless I'm missing something in your question. The number of states is n. Yes. Right? And then, and then we are observing m states. Yes. Right. You are observing m the state using m sensors. Using m sensors. Yeah. Okay. So, so here we are uh, calculating the residual based on the measured uh, values. Yes. Which are m numbers. Right. And then we are. Estimating all the states which are in M. Yes. Using yes. So these are all these are all uh, vectors in R n. Yes. This is all vector in R n because they are like estimating the entire state, okay. but using only M minus Q sensors, right? <coughs> So 
to the dimension of x hat t of j yes is still n it's still n yes, yes. so x hat t is still n and this i ranges from 1 to n this i so i'm doing it element by element estimation based on all the valid estimates i have yes please Can you device, is it fine to have a sensor bias random sensor bias test you take a limit uh, from that particular sensor yeah so your question is about the bias right in the estimate so the question is how much bias are you able to tolerate so let me give you an example in the case of an aircraft they want to they can tolerate a bias of 10 meters okay so if this is the land aircraft is here 10 meters above the ground it's okay the pilot will take care of the landing part right when it is in the air you can tolerate even larger errors let's say 50 meters or 100 meters that's fine because you're not going to be within 100 meters of any other aircraft um, in the case of rocket you can probably tolerate even more right because you're not you're you're in the outer space most of the time uh, but in the case of an autonomous vehicle you probably want to have error or bias of the order of three or four centimeters or maybe like half a meter but but not like 10 meters. In 10 meters, you are like out of the road or something, right? So, so now the bias, bias, you could have a bias in the, so in the case of a vehicle, if the vehicle is going in this direction, you can have a bias with respect to the center of the lane, and you can have a bias with respect to the position of the vehicle in the longitudinal motion. And so you can tolerate far more bias in the longitudinal part, but very little bias in the lateral part. So those are the things that you will have to worry about when you start talking about biases. And, which is why I feel that autonomous cars will not be, will never be around because they are so unsecure with respect to all of these minor attacks. Um, so, but that's just my, uh, <laughs> my two cents, but there are billions of dollars invested in it. So <laughs> I guess my two cents is, is really uh, epsilon. <laughs> uh, I think according to the latest estimates, about uh, 50 or 70 billion dollars have been invested in autonomous car companies in the last decade. Right, so that's a lot of money actually. <laughs> uh, and I know, I know for sure, I think in this class there are like 18 students and I think about 10 or 11 of them are doing their course project on autonomous vehicles, which is a good thing, you know, hopefully that will dissuade you from going into that industry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is, the, this is known as resilient estimation. It is resilient because it doesn't matter what the adversary does, like as long as it's sticking to only Q sensors out of M, um, you, your estimate will always be resilient in the sense that you will always be close to xt. This x hat t will be close to xt, provably, uh, as long as all those assumptions are met in your, in your, in your problem. Okay? Um, now, the thing is, as far as the general methodologies goes, we have already covered all the general methods for response. Okay? So I'm not quite sure what I'm going to teach next Monday and the Monday after that. Because all the general things that the mankind knows as of today is already covered. Now whatever I can teach you will be very specific to a specific system and a specific attack and a specific uh, response scheme. So I'm still trying to debate what should I do. Uh, because when I go into specifics, then there is physics of the system. Like for instance, if I talk about power systems, then I have to talk about phasor measurement unit, then voltage, phase angle, dynamics, and then complicated set of equations. I'm kind of wondering that may not be beneficial in a classroom setting because it's just too, too deep into one specific field. So I'll try to keep searching for more ideas on what I can present in Monday's class. 
But if not, then I will cancel the lecture on Monday and the next Monday. So for the next Monday, I'm actually trying to get the person who manages the cybersecurity for the entire campus, cybersecurity of buildings for the entire campus, I'm trying to get him to speak in our class to, to give us some ideas about what happens in a real, real world industrial control system. So actually, the thermal management in building is considered an industrial control system. University is an industry, and this is a control system inside an industry, so it's an industrial control system. So I'm trying to get him to talk to us about uh, the challenges. I'm not sure whether he will accept or not. He's still thinking about it. He's still deciding. So if he comes, then the next Monday, the Monday after Thanksgiving class, we'll have his uh, views and his thoughts and his experience shared with us. And then Wednesday onwards, you all have to present. And you all have to pick at what time you want to present. <laughs> So please, uh, I'll, I'll send out an announcement today. Please fill in the information on when you want to present your research topic. And if the two classes get canceled, then uh, just use that time to focus on your project. And if you have any questions on your project or anything related to the course, please come back to me and we can have a meeting and, and discuss whatever your problems are. Okay, thank you.